story how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sin, won the victory, a victory. broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he stopped me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him titling this, How Quickly Things Change. And it's a familiar story. Most of you will know this from Luke 4. And Jesus has been baptized and he's gone through the temptation in the wilderness and he's returned in the power of the Spirit. And so um, I'm going to read beginning at Luke chapter 4 verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. Now, it was customary when you read the scroll that you stood. After you read them, then you sat down and then you make any comments or there's a discussion after you've read them. But the reading of the scripture was from a standing position. You'll go to some churches, and their tradition is when the scriptures are read, everybody stands. You've been to a place like that, or you've seen it on TV? Well, this, it gets its origin from the Jewish custom and tradition. 
I, I'm not supporting one or the other. I'm just saying that's where that comes from. So the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him, meaning Jesus. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. So you've seen these scrolls, right? They're, they're big and they're on a wooden spindle and they're covered and they're protected and you got to unroll it, you got to unwrap it and then you got to unroll it. And I'm not sure how that's done. I don't think it falls on the floor. I think they treat it with more respect than that. He may have a helper that helps him roll. I don't know if it's on a table and you're wrapping it get up as you're on. I don't, I don't know. But it takes some time. You don't just open like your Bible. <laughs> In three seconds, you're at Isaiah. That isn't how that works. So he finds the place where it's written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. I'm going to stop there. I'll give you three little points there in parentheses. It's not just the spiritually poor. We could spiritualize this point and say that he means poor in spirit. No, nope. the word that's used in the original language means destitute, downtrodden, oppressed, um, people in bad shape, people that are poor. 90% of the people in Jesus' day were considered poor. Most of them were working to survive. There were a few beggars, and they were trying to survive. There were few elites, landowners, politicians, people with means, people with money. 90% of the people were poor. Being poor, in their understanding, meant that God did not favor you. The people making the rules, the religious leaders and the political leaders, took the station in life as an indicator of God's blessing or lack thereof on your life. So when Jesus says, I'm bringing good news to the poor, everybody's excited because it's most of the congregation, most who's listening. They're, they're pretty thrilled about it. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Well, can you kind of hear the gears working in their head? They're thinking, I'm about to have a reversal of fortune. Right? So Jesus is using, in his speaking here, he's taking this passage to use known conditions to illustrate spiritual truths or kingdom realities. The poor, the captives, the oppressed. If you were poor, often you had debt. And often you were either imprisoned or you volunteered for slavery to pay the debt. Maybe your subsistence or your survival, you could not make it on your own. So you volunteered to be a servant or a slave. Because you knew that's how you were going to provide for your family. So rather than you making it on your own, you'd go be a slave for somebody. You'd have shelter. You'd have food. You'd have provision. So the poor came with oppression and imprisonment. They were captives. It was common. It was a known social condition. And that's for all of you BLM supporters. Slavery didn't happen when the white people decided to take the black people and build America, as you claim. So allow me to be political for a moment. Those of you who are sympathetic with how slaves have been treated, you need to read your history and go back to find that slavery has been same color on same color and one color on a different color for centuries hundreds of centuries, thousands of years. Slavery was not new when blacks came from Africa. By the way, the blacks in Africa sold the blacks from Africa to the whites. So a little history, a little honesty, a little intellectual integrity would be helpful in discussions about social norms or the mores or the how people treat one another. And, and another thing, the Bible answers all the questions of how we are to socially interact with each other. And skin color is never an issue. 
We are all made from one blood. We all bleed red. And just below the surface, we're all the same color. We all have likes and fears, and love and needs and yada yada. We're all the same. No, because you've been raised in a different part of the world and you have different culture, you have a different God, you have a different religion, you have a different value system, you have a different morality. But the Bible and its morality applies to every nation, every person under the sun. There are no exceptions. So that's my free speech. So Jesus is addressing the poor, the captives, and the oppressed. He's going to address the blind in a moment. But so far, they're with him. He has a great reputation. They've heard about him. He's speaking in their synagogue, and they're pumped. They're jazzed. This guy speaks wonderfully. Everybody speaks well of him. He's here in our synagogue today, and we like what he's saying. This sounds like a really good deal. So uh, I just kind of explained again, and I'll, it's on the screen, being poor often led to imprisonment or slavery, oppressed by those in power positions, and 90% of the people were, in fact, poor, so they're pretty excited. So verse 20, he rolled up the scroll, which again takes a little bit of time. He handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Nobody was nodding off. He had their rapt attention, R-A-P-T, not W-R-A-P-P-E-D, or rapt, no, <laughs> rapt. They were caught away, man. They thought, wow, what's he going to say next? Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Well, don't you know their mind leaped? They've been waiting for the Messiah for thousands of years. About 2,000. Now, most people aren't that old, but, you know, generationally in their history, they know for centuries they've been waiting for the Messiah. And he says, it's fulfilled. They're thinking, we are in the prophetic end time. This is it. The kingdom is, whoa. And their mind went a thousand miles an hour, relatively speaking. Verse 22, everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. And then, and then, how quickly things changed. Um, how can this be? They asked, isn't this Joseph's son? We saw him grow up. How, how, how can this the Spirit of the Lord is on him to preach to the poor the good news? What? So they began to question his authority. Applying human reasoning to God's ideas seldom works. Let me give you two examples. You live by dying. Or you increase by giving away. See, God's economy is backwards than ours. So you try to bring your human rationale to the way God thinks. It just is hardly ever going to make any sense to us. The Bible in the New Testament says we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. When we are born again, we receive the mind of Christ. We have a new paradigm, a new way to view the world. And this just shall live by faith, trusting in God idea is not how we want to live our life. We like things to be solid, predictable, and uh, I, I want some control. Thank you very much. Anybody in the room a control freak? Anybody in the room a liar? I like that control, too. <laughs> we're just, we're funny people. So Jesus begins to address their doubt. Um, can't even talk. He begins to address how they're doubting. Their basic uh, doubt factor is his right or his authority to claim the right to speak 
such audacious things. How dare you? We know your lineage. We know where you came from. We know your history. We know your mom and dad. We saw you as a kid. You're one of us. How could you be, wait a second, how could you be the Messiah? Hold on a minute. Then he said, as he begins to rub it in, he says, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. Meaning, do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly, there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And now they're thinking, where's this headed? And he grabs another salt shaker and said, and many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. But the only one healed was Naaman, the Syrian. Well, he just said, it's going to be God's favor. You're going to have a reversal of fortune. And now he's seemingly saying that God smiles on other people, not you. See, this, let me intersect for a second here or interject this. They thought they had a special relationship with God. It was their lineage. They had an inside track. And how dare this guy, whom they know, claim to have authority to speak and express how God thinks and behaves? How in the world can he tell us that God is choosing somebody other than a Jew on whom to bestow his blessing and favor? The nerve. They want to hear about God being merciful to a non-Israelite. So I'm thinking, well, what, what can we draw? If you are a Christian for selfish reasons, you might not be what you think you are. We follow Jesus because he's worthy to be followed. He's the only Savior. We don't follow Jesus because we might get some prosperity. We might get a healing. We might get some kind of special favor. That's not why we follow Jesus. It doesn't matter, and, and I hope you've come to this conclusion. I have some time back. I said to the Lord one day, it doesn't matter if I ever feel your presence again. It doesn't matter if you never speak to me again. If I never feel the anointing, if I never get another insight, it doesn't matter. You've already done enough for me to be fully and thoroughly persuaded that you are the only Savior. You alone are God and King, and I will serve and honor you all the days I have my breath. So you're not obligated to do anything for me. I serve you because you are worthy to be served. There's a gospel that's often preached to try to appeal to people's felt needs. If you watch Christian television at all, you'll see it. It sells books, it sells TV time, it makes the money roll. It makes my stomach want to hurl. It makes my skin crawl. It's creepy. It's not the gospel. We follow Jesus. He's the one we lift up. Does he do those things? Sure. But when and where and on whom he chooses. Why? Because he's sovereign. He doesn't have to explain anything to me or you. We want an explanation. You're not going to get one. And you're certainly not, I mean, are you going to pull a job and demand that God show up and give you some explanation? And God will say, well, excuse me. You're not qualified to make any decision. Where were you when I did such and such? And I just think it's a matter of perspective. See, living in God's kingdom is not about you getting God's kingdom benefits. It's about telling others about kingdom benefits. See, this is, we're a consumer society, and we believe that we have some kind of uh, right. I can remember back in the 70s, the popular saying was, I'm the head and not the tail. 
You ever heard that? Christ is the head, not the tail. And we do belong to him. And we are the bride of Christ, and I get all that. And I don't deny that God sometimes bestows favor and blessing and healing on his children. There's no question about that. But this is a matter of motivation for you and me. Our perspective is determined by our motivation. We die to live. We give away to make room so we can receive. Motivation is everything. God knows our heart. Jeremiah, by the Spirit of God, wrote this. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Not only can I not know yours, I can't even know mine. We are deceptive. Self-deception is happens to everybody. How do you think a preacher goes south? How do these big time Charlies, no offense to anybody named Charlie, how do these guys who get too big for their britches believe they're going get to get, get away with sin? Have you gone stark raving crazy? I won't mention names, but you know who they are. They just slip off the rails and go downhill and crash and burn, and it's terrible. You think, well, how could anybody in their right mind think that way? I've often said, I'll say it again here, sin makes you stupid. You, you don't mean to be stupid, but once you decide that you can get away with sin, that you can avoid the, the law that says, what you sow, that you will also reap. So Jesus is just trying to explain to these followers of Jehovah, followers of Yahweh, keeping all the rules, that they don't understand how God thinks at all. When they hear that God is blessing somebody outside their domain, see, they deserve the blessing. They're the Jews. They're God's chosen people. How dare God bless somebody else? When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd <laughs> and went on his way. I don't know how he did that. I don't know what camouflage he used. I don't know if he had a hoodie. I, I don't know how he did that, but suddenly nobody in the crowd recognized him. He just slipped right through them. They're all pushing to push him to the edge and he just walked through the crowd and went on his way. Why? Well, good. it wasn't his time. But I thought, wow, what's my application here? Well, we're not seeking to be popular. We're seeking to be obedient to the faith. Proclaim the faith once delivered to the saints. It is important that a man wants to die after that the judgment. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. There is a loving God. There is a hell to be shunned. Those are basic tenements of the gospel that often are forsaken in the messages you hear or read about. Um, we, we are obligated to tell people maybe what they don't want to hear. It's what they need to hear, but not what they want to hear. Sorry. I'm pretty sure that God's idea of church is not to make you happy. I think it's designed to help make you holy. So this religious mob turned into a murderous mob. I think it's important we try to understand how God thinks, but I'm not sure we ever will. We know God loves everybody, right? But he loves people you don't love. What's up with that? <laughs> Those people aren't lovable. They're not worthy to be loved, and God loves them. Huh, how can that be? The kingdom benefits that you receive are a byproduct of you sharing the kingdom news with other people. When you pray one for another, you're healed. When you share the gospel and somebody receives the gospel, we rejoice when sinners repent. Heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. Remember the old song, there's a new name written down in glory? The white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven. 
never more to roam. There's something about a sinner coming to Christ that exhilarates me. I hope it does you. If you're a consumer Christian, you might want to rethink the motivation of why you're following Jesus at all. We're not sharing with others what we got. We're sharing with others who Jesus is. Come follow Jesus if, and you can learn how to get rich. Shut up. I know I'm not supposed to say that. God has so much work to do in me. Uh, me. I won't let you worry about you. I just get so... shouldn't confess this, I suppose. I get really irritated with those who proclaim the false gospels of the world. It just torques me. What are we sharing about Jesus? Well, he's the only Savior. He's the one who delivers from sin. He'll deliver from every bondage of hell, every vice of Satan, everything that grips you, every sinful habit. <laughs> Every sin that will so easily beset you and weigh you down, Hebrews 12, we lay aside the sin that so easily besets us. Lay all those things off. Pursue and follow after Jesus, author and finisher of our faith. We want to invite other people to receive this free gift. It's, it's not about giving you 10 steps to financial freedom, as important as they may be. I'm not saying those things aren't important. It'd be really important as a follower of Jesus that you not be in debt if you can help it. And that you not beat people out of the money that you owe them. The guy said, I'd rather owe it to you than beat you out of it. Either way, they're not getting paid, right? <laughs> so that's just semantics. You know, be honest. Keep your marriage vow. Try to keep your mind and mouth clean. Honor God. You know that God listens to every conversation you have. I'll give you one more than that. God listens to every conversation you have in your head. Even the ones that don't come out of your mouth, he knows every thought in your mind. It'd be good for you to think, Lord, how can I honor you? The saying is, if you want to be blessed by God, be blessable, right? But we want to share the good news about Jesus forgiving your sins. Because he forgave mine, and he'll forgive yours. You don't have to live with guilt. That's the gospel. And how God blesses or not, read Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith chapter. They weren't financially blessed. But they're the heroes of the faith. Could God count on you to be a hero of the faith? If you experienced no blessing, how quickly would you turn if you thought God wasn't blessing you? We may live through a time soon in our nation where our freedoms are gone, and you will think God's blessing has been lifted. And I don't doubt that at some point God's blessing may be lifted from this country. We certainly don't deserve the blessings we now have. But I don't deserve the blessings I have. And God is gracious, but that's not why I follow him. I follow him because he's the only way I'm ever going to get to heaven. And I'm not plumb stupid. I know hell is to be avoided at all costs. And all costs have been paid. So all I need to do is accept and receive Jesus. That's something worth proclaiming. And uh, I have joy over that. So if you get caught up in the why them, why are they getting blessed, it could be that Jesus will just camouflage himself and walk right past you, and you'll receive nothing. Lord, would you help us to stay clearly focused on you? Your blessings are beyond counting, but Lord, that's not why we serve you. We serve you because you are the son of the living God. You're God in the flesh, risen from the dead, glorified, sitting at the seat of honor and power and authority at the right hand of the Father. And you are coming back to receive those 
who are excitedly looking for your coming. And Lord, we anticipate a return. So if we live long enough, we expect to see you appear in the clouds and take us to be with you forever. But if time catches up with me, and I go by way of the grave, I am not diminished in my hope or my joy. I am excited about spending eternity with you, Lord, and all of the saints who have gone before me, and all the saints yet to come. So, Father, we look to you, we bless you, we honor you, we praise you, we follow you with all our heart, because you alone are worthy. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.